So let's recall our motivation. <clears throat> and although we start out every morning with a bodhicitta motivation, it kind of uh, can get lost during the day. So it's good periodically throughout the day to really stop and come back and remember why we're doing what we're doing. To center ourselves around our spiritual practice. To remember to be kind, compassionate, tolerant, and to recall uh, emptiness when we can during the day. So coming back to these things again and again every day. And then as we do, because we're very much creatures of habit, then these attitudes uh, become part of us. They become something uh, quite normal and natural. At the beginning it may feel rather uh, contrived, <clears throat> and it is contrived, but it becomes natural after a while. And then as our mind, we you know, really train our mind to go in a different direction, then the afflictions that are very natural now become something that uh, stick out and we notice them more. Kind of, what's that thought doing here? It doesn't belong here. And so, you know, we can really see what happens uh, when we train the mind, when we practice, when there's familiarity and how the mind uh, shifts quite naturally and establishes many new habits. And along with those new habits comes a greater feeling of ease within us. You know, not so much self-doubt or fear or self-centeredness. mind is, is more relaxed, more receptive, more open. So let's make right now one of those times when we're remembering these values and how we want to be in the world, centering our life on them, and then making them our motivation as we go forth in learning about debate. So we're just now wrapping up uh, the Exploring Monastic Life program. And in many of the interviews that I'm having with the participants, uh, you know, there's some common points that people bring up again and again. And one of them is uh, their appreciation for how open the group was. In the discussions, how people really shared quite openly, quite honestly, without, uh, you know, anxiety or, uh, you know, fear of how am I going to look or what are people going to say. Uh, and I think that surprised a lot of the people that you could be in a group of people that you didn't know very well when you first came. And in the process of two and a half weeks, you develop very strong trust in them. And 
you know, where you can really open and talk about some very personal things and how, uh, what a good feeling that is. You know, people really seem to feel quite happy about being able to be open like that. Am I describing it correctly? Yeah. So that's a, a very beautiful thing that, that I too see uh, with the EMR, EML course and how people transform in it. And, you know, just thinking if we could have that uh, kind of openness and trust with each other more in society in general. Yeah, if there's a way to foster that because it really brings people together in, in quite a beautiful way. And then people are so much more just at ease and relaxed. So uh, let's think of how we can do that and how all of us, you know, the EML participants as you go in different directions, how you can take that quality and share that with the people you meet wherever you're going to. So, we're going to get back to debate and talking about anxiety and fear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with this difficult topic that we're, we happen to be on, um, which I've decided and can you know, consulted with a few of the people, uh, that we're going to skip, okay, a few pages in here. Uh, I'll give the general uh, conclusion, the point that he's trying to make, but uh, we won't read the whole thing, because even when you read what, what Purdue is saying, you could see that he's not even sure about what he's saying. So I think uh, that's a good excuse for our not understanding it. Unless someone here understands that section. I don't know. I've read it several times. Did you? Yeah. Okay. So because you really have to know something about Western philosophy, because he's comparing a Western philosophical method with a Buddhist one. And I think that's kind of beyond uh, what, it, uh, <clears throat> what our interest is. Okay, so I'll just read a little bit to, to, so that the, the purpose of what he's trying to say becomes very clear. Okay, so... Um, okay, so we have... And I'm starting to read where it says, thus, in order for the second and third modes of the sign. Can you see it? Thus, in order for the second and third modes of the sign to be established, the first mode, the property of the subject, must first be established. That entails that a fully qualified opponent must ascertain by valid cognition the property of the subject in the syllogism at hand. So that's the first thing we do when we're looking at a syllogism, is make sure that we check if the reason is established in the subject, if the reason is a property of the subject. And we make sure that, uh, that the syllogism is being given to somebody who is a suitable vessel, somebody who is interested in this topic, who wants to know, who has the capability of understanding, yeah, and who knows how to uh, look at a syllogism and, you know, check the different components of it. Okay, so uh, he's using, yeah, this is uh, using the syllogism that is the standard for explaining Buddhist rules of logic for certain persons. Product is a is a correct sign in the syllogism. Uh, the subject sound is an impermanent phenomenon because of being a product. Okay. So recall from chapter 6, 
uh, that each of the three modes of a, uh, or three criteria of a correct sign has epistemological requirements for the person to whom the argument is stated. So he keeps emphasizing this again and again. It has to be to a person, uh, uh, a suitable person. Yeah. So it's not just that the argument is laid out according to all the rules, but that the person is somebody who has the ability to understand it and is interested in this topic and has not yet understood the topic. So thus, even if the sign is a property of the subject in the real world and the forward pervasion and counter pervasion are true to the way that things are in the world, they do not hold as components of a correct sign unless they are ascertained as such by a person to whom the argument is stated. Okay. And I think I've explained several times before that when I first started to learn debate, you know, I would see, okay, here's how a syllogism is laid out. And I'd look at it and I'd go, but that doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. And shouldn't it do something for me? Or shouldn't it do something? I make a syllogism. Shouldn't somebody else understand that? And this is exactly why those syllogisms are not are not correct syllogisms because they the form might have been correct and they may have been true but they weren't given to an appropriate person who wanted to know that and could understand it okay so this is uh, actually something that is quite humbling for us because lots of times have you had the experience of trying to explain something to somebody and they just don't get it. Yeah? And it's quite obvious to you how to do this. And the other person is gone, huh? You know, kind of like when you're trying to show me something on the computer and I'm going, wait a minute, how did you get there to that page? Yeah? Because the other person is just going, bing, 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 and, you know, I'm going, huh? Okay, so it's really emphasizing the point here for us uh, that if we want to communicate, we have to slow down and see where the person that we want to communicate with is and then give something that is suitable for them at their level. Okay, so it's it's very humbling in, in that way that we can't just say, okay, well, I understand it, so blah, 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 blah. And then, oh, this person's so dumb, they don't get it. No, it's, you know, we haven't taken the time to really think about how to communicate well. Yeah, Because it isn't just saying a bunch of words that sound good, that make sense to somebody who already understands. It's talking to somebody who doesn't understand but wants to, and being able to explain it to them. Okay, so uh, for instance, it may be that the pervasion in the sample syllogism above, that all products are impermanent phenomena, is true in the sense of the way things are in the world. However, even if that is the case, if the reason is not established, that pervasion is not valid with respect to asserting a correct sign. It simply doesn't apply. So, you know, when you're writing, uh, uh, doing a syllogism, if we say, you know, sound is impermanent because it's a product, okay? So sound is the subject, and we want to know something about sound. Yeah? <clears throat> and we're doing this whole syllogism because we want to understand something about sound. So that's why understanding, establishing that the reason is a property of the subject is the first thing that we do. Because we're talking about sound and we want to see, does that reason have anything to do with sound? Okay, if it has nothing to do with sound, then we stop there. Because then uh, the syllogism isn't going to tell us anything about sound, and sound is the thing we're concerned with. 
Okay, so th so that's why we don't check the pervasion first. We check the uh, the property of the subject first. Okay, because the pervasion may be correct, and it's true that the you know uh, the pervasion may be correct, <clears throat> but that's not gonna. Uh, make the the argument something suitable for that person unless we're talking about the subject that they want to know something about. You know, if they want to know about daisies and we say sound is impermanent because it's a product, you know, they're going to go, I, I'm not interested at all. This has nothing to do. I want, tell me about daisies. So then if you go, daisies are impermanent because they're a product, and the person goes, oh, daisies are a product. Ah, oh, that's true. You know, they grow from seeds. Yeah. And then, okay, I'm interested because I want to learn about daisies. And they're a product. And then you go on and say, you know, whatever is a product is necessarily impermanent. It's like, oh, yeah, daisies are impermanent. I pick them and I put them in the water and I offer them to the Buddha. And I re actually don't need a, a syllogism to see that they get old and die. Yeah, except the syllogism is about subtle impermanence, not the gross impermanence. But if you're sharp, then you know that if something has gross impermanence, then it must have subtle impermanence. Because it isn't like something you know, like the daisy is fresh and beautiful and then from one moment to the next becomes dead. You know, there's a process in there so you can infer the process that goes on. Okay? So that's why, you know, we always check the, uh, the, the uh, try to establish the reason in the, in the subject first. Okay. Uh, what is important and what we should keep in mind is whether or not the syllogism is valid. The validity of the syllogism taken as a whole is what determines the truth and correctness of its components. So the syllogism as a whole has to be correct, not just in the way that it's formulated, but that it's said to an appropriate person. And if the whole syllogism is correct, then the parts must be correct. Whereas if, even if the parts are correct, if it's not said to the right person, the whole syllogism isn't correct. Okay? Or even if one part, even if the reason is established in the subject, is correct, if the pervasion isn't, again, the syllogism is is not correct at all. Okay. So I'm trying to think. It's kind of, I guess it's like, this is the example that, that popped into my mind. When you're, you know, if you're, if you, <laughs> if you're in Las Vegas and you're with the one hand bandit, you may get, you know, two strawberries in a row, but they're worthless unless you have the third strawberry, too. Okay? So, you know, one strawberry is great, two strawberry, but they're totally worthless. You're not going to get anything unless there's three. So it's kind of like that with this. You have to have all of the components, you know, and then you get a bunch of quarters, you know, falling on your lap. I don't know why that example <laughs> came into my mind, <laughs> except <laughs> I was leading a retreat once, and it was for Chapman students, and they were flying up from Southern California to, to Portland, and they were supposed to arrive at the airport at a certain time, and they weren't there. Why? Because they started playing the slot machines. In, in Vegas or Reno, where they were transiting, and they missed their flight up to Portland. <laughs> so that has always stuck in my mind. <laughs> yeah. So it came up there. 
Don't ask me what latencies were ripening, but something I hardly ever think of came in my mind at that moment. Okay. Uh, so the validity of the syllogism taken as a whole is what determines the truth and correctness of its components. So if one component holds but the other two fail, the syllogism is not valid and thus the com components are not true or correct. Even if the pervasion holds in all cases in the world, it cannot be considered to be true for a person who does not understand such as a person who does not understand speech or for a person who is not seeking to know the truth of the pervasion, such as a person who has already understood it. Thus, the pervasion cannot be true for such persons and the syllogism would not be a valid argument. Or a person who doesn't have enough background information to understand. The reason, uh, that the reason must be established in order for pervasion to be true seems to imply that the Buddha's truth table, okay, and here's where he's going off, okay. Buddhists don't have truth tables. He's taking a Western philosophical idea and trying to apply Buddhist, you know, syllogisms to it. So we're going to... Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to come back. Okay. So the paragraph starts. The most interesting issue is with the third line. But we're not going to uh, start from the top of the paragraph. We're going to start a few lines down. However, the Buddha's guideline is that if the reason is not established, then the pervasion, that is the conditional sentence, cannot be known to be true, and so it cannot be a component of a valid argument. So he's repeating here the conclusion. Yeah. See where I am? Again, this is related to the order, so we really didn't skip very much. Um, again, this is related to the order of understanding. If we think of validity as derived solely from the considerations of the form of the argument, it may seem to us that whether or not all products are impermanent, the second criteria, does not depend on whether or not we have established that sound is a product, the first criteria. You know, in other words, the two criteria seem totally separate, you know, and independent of each other. But he says, indeed, these two facts are independent on paper, but in Buddhist reasoning and debate, as understood in this system, for both the syllogism and the consequence, there are epistemological concerns. They are, they are arguments in relation to persons. That last clause is important. The arguments are given in relations to different people. They're not just like puzzle pieces that you put together. If someone has not understood that sound is a product, the information that all products are impermanent will not impact that person's understanding of sound. In fact, they won't even be interested in it because they want to learn about sound. Thus, even if it's true that all products are impermanent, okay, that's the pervasion, in relation to certain persons, an argument that includes that pervasion is not valid in the sense that it does not further the knowledge of the listener with respect to the subject because the reason is not established. Okay. Such persons have not ascertained that sound is a product. So they have to ascertain that part first. Yeah. For the epistemolog epistemolog epistemologist, epistemologist, epistemologist in the system, an argument is valid only when it is able to bring forth new understanding. Uh, 
us in this system, and he's repeating here, um, in this system of thought, whether or not a pervasion holds is not relevant until the first mode of the sign, the property of the subject, holds, because it is the syllogism as a whole that is important. In a valid syllogism, the sign is called a correct sign. Yeah. The understanding in the Buddhist epistemology is holistic in the sense that the validity of the syllogism as a whole determines the correctness of all the components of that syllogism. Okay? So having three strawberries in a row determines the benefit of having the first strawberry and the second strawberry. Okay? Otherwise, if you don't have that third one, your first two strawberries go to waste. <laughs> okay. In this system of thought, they would not say, well, the pervasion is correct, but the sign is incorrect, and these two things can be taken separately. So they, they, they won't say that. If one is not correct, all are not correct. Thus, even if all the components are true on paper, the argument may not be valid. Okay, so let's go a little bit where it says, the subject uncomposed space is an impermanent phenomena because of being a product. Okay, you see that it's intended. Okay, so you look at that syllogism and yeah, is, is, is it accurate? Uncomposed space is an impermanent phenomenon because of being a product. No. Okay, what did you check first when you looked at it? Which is, what's the property of the subject? So uncomposed space, is it a product? No, why not? Why isn't it a product? Uh, because it's it's not created by causes and conditions. Okay. So um, no part of this is accurate. Uncomposed space as a permanent phenomena is not a product. Thus the reason is not established and the first mode of the sign cannot obtain for anyone. So then it's useless to go on and check the... Uh, the uh, pervasion. Okay. Since there cannot be a person who understands the first mode of the sign that uncomposed space is a product, there cannot be either forward pervasion or counter pervasion, the last two modes of a correct sign. Thus, for the Buddhists, the truth value of the conditional pervasion in this fourth, well, I'm just, we're going to skip that indefinite part because that. I don't understand what he's saying there. But I think you get the, the point here. Okay. Okay, so then go to the top of the next paragraph. In any case, in this system of Buddha oops. In this system of Buddhist reasoning and debate, the truth or falsity of the pervasion is rendered completely irrelevant unless and until the reason has been established. If the pervasion is correct, but the reason is not established, the whole argument fails. If the pervasion is incorrect and the reason is not established, the whole argument fails. Therefore, no time should be spent even considering whether or not the pervasion is correct until the reason is established. So don't get excited about your first two strawberries until you get the third one. Okay? The reason must also be established, must always be established first, because it would be useless to consider pervasions, whether they hold or fail, if the reason is not established. Okay? Because the person wants to know about the, the subject, and if the reason doesn't pertain to the subject, then they're not going to get any new information about that.
that subject. Thus, if the reason is not established, that is the defender's first answer. Also, if an argument is such that both the reason is not established and there is no provision, the defender first has to deny the establishment of the reason. So if you're having a debate with somebody, you know, and the first thing the defender has to examine is, is the reason the property of the subject? Yeah. The, the, you know, nobody looks at the pervasion first. Okay, so then the next session, a section, the order of the answers. It is devilishly difficult to catch yourself in the process of thought, even if it is something you do over and over again. I have never heard any debater lay out the procedure for deciding which answer to give to an argument. Yeah, interesting. Perhaps they don't lay it out because people do it differently. Perhaps it is one of those things that is so obvious debate teachers don't feel that they need to explain it. But I know American students, and American students need some explanation of the procedure to sort out the answers. Okay, so the Tibetans pick it up, I don't know, you know, somehow through maybe just doing it. Um, but he's going to lay out the whole debate procedure for, for the NGs. Okay, here are some guidelines provided by the system that lead us to consider what answer we should give to an argument and what the checking procedure is. You know how it goes. If you do this by rote repetition for a while, then you will come to the point where you won't need to think about it any longer. That's the point where we want to come to, okay? Where it just becomes so automatic that you just automatically look to see if the reason is established. You don't even have to think about what you're doing. Okay, think, for example, of driving to a place for a job interview. Your first trip there, uh, and now, years later, having gotten the job, you drive there effortlessly. Yeah. So, you know, first time you go there, it's like, where do I turn? You know, <laughs> and you have to be really careful and think about it. Then you get the job, it's, you just know where to go. Okay. This is like that. So it is good to develop the habit of following the procedures in the right order so that you will come up with right answers. When you are weighing the value of a three-part argument stated to you, whether a syllogism or a consequence, so here he's laying out the order and how you do it. Okay, what do you think is the first thing? Yeah, to see if the, if the reason if you, is established, if the reason is the property of the subject. Okay, so that's what he says. First, check to see if the reason is established. Wonder. Does that one, meaning the subject, have the quality of that three, meaning the reason? So here he's giving one refers to the subject, two to the predicate, three to the reason. Okay. Or another way, is that reason a quality of that subject? If the reason is itself a pervasion, for example, because whatever is a functioning thing is necessarily an established base. That's kind of a big reason, okay? <laughs> you weigh the value of the reason without reference to any subject. If the reason has both a subject and a predicate inside, like because it is an established base, you decide the value of the reason by replacing it with the stated subject. Okay, the sound is impermanent because it is a product. Okay, so it be, because it is a product is, is the reason. Yeah, you don't need to say because it is a product. You could say, you know, because it's 
Yeah, because it's a product. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then it refers to sound. That's what he's saying. You just put the subject in there. Is that clear? Kind of like mud. Anyway, I think you, you understand it, even if you don't think you do. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So then the second thing. If the reason is not established, that is your top priority answer. At this point, you do not need to look any further. Okay? So, you know, the, the thing failed because you don't have the, the reason is not the property of the subject. So note well, even if the point of clarification, so that talking about a consequence, yeah, where we call the second part, we don't call it a, a, a predicate, we call it a point of, of clarification. Yeah. Even if the point of clarification is true of the subject, if the reason is not established, you cannot accept it. Okay? So even if you tell me what's true, but the reason you use to prove it isn't the right reason, then it's the whole thing is not valid. Okay? Yeah. So it's, yeah, you have to be able to give the correct reason. If, if you say, um, uh, you know, okay, uh, Venerable Tarpa is in, an, is in Ananda because I saw her go in the door, uh, but you didn't see her go in the door. Yeah, uh, she may be an Ananda, but what you said is not correct because you didn't give a valid reason for it. You fibbed. <laughs> okay. Okay, note well, even if the point of clarification is true of the subject, if the reason is not established, you cannot accept it. For instance, in the consequence, it follows that the subject sound is a functioning thing because of being permanent. Okay, so don't look at what the book says. What do you think of, of that, um, of that uh, consequence? It follows that the subject sound is a functioning thing because of being permanent. Okay, so the reason isn't established. Why not? Yeah, okay, because it's saying sound is permanent. And sound isn't impermanent, okay? I mean, it's saying sound is permanent, but sound isn't impermanent. Is it permanent? <laughs> okay, but what's the thesis? I mean, what's the, the point of clarification in there? The sound is a functioning thing. That's true, isn't it? Yeah, but you, so you're saying what's true, but you're giving the wrong reason. Okay, so the whole thing doesn't work. Okay, so even if, if you say that, even though it is true that sound is a functioning thing, you cannot accept it because the challenger didn't prove it. Okay, they're just, they're just, bla the challenger's blabbering. Okay, then the step three, if the reason is established, yeah, Check to see if there is pervasion. So wonder, is it the case that whatever is that three, the reason, is necessarily that two, the predicate? Okay. So note well, as in the case above, for an argument in which the reason is not established, but the point of clarification is true of the subject, here too, Though the point of clarification may be true of the subject, if there is no pervasion, you cannot accept it. Okay. For instance, for the consequence, it follows that the subject's sound is a functioning thing because of being an established base. Okay. So what do you think about that? It follows that the subject's sound is a functioning thing because of being an established base. 
okay? Why isn't there pervasion thing? So something that's an established base isn't necessarily um, a functioning thing. And so if you're doing a diagram, you have the, the big circle of established base and then one small circle within that that's called functioning. So even though that it is true that sound is a functioning thing, you cannot accept it because the challenger did not prove it. Okay, then four, if there is no pervasion, with a click, quick glance, check to see if the pervasion is opposite. So remember before when we talked about if there's a three-part syllogism or a three-part consequence, there's four possible thing, ways that the defender can uh, respond. Do you remember that? What, what are they? Hmm? I accept. Okay, the reason's not established. No pervasion. And the pervasion is opposite. Okay? So when it's a three-part syllogism or a three-part um, consequence, then the defender can say, you know, ha has to say one of those three. Four. Just checking. Glad you're listening. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here he's saying, if there's no pervasion, with a click, quick glance, check to see if the pervasion is opposite. Is this necessary to do? No. Why not? Because already saying there's no pervasion covers this one. So why do you say this one? Why do you put forth the extra effort to see if the the reason is the opposite. Yeah, it's a stronger response. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you'll see as we go here. Okay. So wonder, is it the case that whatever is that three, that reason, is necessarily not that two, the predicate? So before, when you're checking for pervasion, you're checking, is the reason necessarily the predicate? And here you're checking, is the reason necessarily not that predicate? Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not that predicate. Yeah. It's necessary, not, not, not necessary. <laughs> okay. So note well, it is not required to give the answer the pervasion is opposite, even when you can. It is just a stronger answer if it is appropriate. Okay, so if we look at that, it follows that the subject is a functioning thing because of being an established base. Would you say that the pervasion is opposite with that one? No, why not? Yeah. <laughs> it, because some established bases are functioning things. It's not necessarily not right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then step five, if the pervasion is opposite, then that's your answer. Then step six, if the pervasion is not opposite, since you check that only because uh, there is no pervasion, then answer there is no pervasion. So you don't say oh, there's no pervasion and then say, hold on, let me think about if the pervasion is opposite. You have to think about if the pervasion is opposite before you give the answer. Okay. If the reason is established and there is pervasion, accept the argument. Okay. 
And then he did a, uh, a graphic form, so you can look at it. The, De the Defender's Answers Decision Tree. <laughs> okay, so if you look, it starts out, with, is the reason established? That's your upper left-hand corner. Okay. If the reason is not established, then that's what you say. The reason is not established. The whole thing ends there. But is the reason established? If the answer is yes, then you go on and you check, is there pervasion? If, uh, and if there isn't pervasion, yeah, then you check, is the pervasion uh, opposite? Okay. If it is opposite, you say the pervasion is opposite. If it's not opposite, you just say there is no pervasion. But if, and, uh, if the pervasion uh, holds, then you say, I accept it. Okay, that diagram makes sense to you? Yeah, it can be very helpful to have it in that form to look at it. And I asked a Westerner who was trained in the debate program whether they ever say the pervasion is opposite. Mm -hmm. she, she, was very, she was like, oh no, you, wouldn't, you never say that. It comes across very arrogant. Or it's, or it's kind of, she would say it, it's like, your answer is so wrong uh, that it is the opposite. <laughs> it was just funny to hear that's how it's perceived. Huh. But I wonder if it's perceived that way by everybody or just, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's really making a point. But, but like she said, it's like saying, your answer was really out to lunch. Yeah. So, but in, when they're debating, they usually don't worry about manners very much. Yeah. I mean, they're already yelling and screaming at each other. So, um, at Delanda, do they yell and scream? And is it, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, but you've seen them in India yell and scream and jump around and, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so learning to spell out your answers. So the tradition is that new debaters are required to spell out their answers in full. In other words, you can't just give an answer that you don't really understand and hope nobody asks you about it. You have to be able to say why you chose that. For instance, uh, they will initially answer simply, I accept it. Okay. Then the challenger will say, spell out your answer, I accept it. Then the new debater will have to fill it in, saying, for instance, I accept that sound is an impermanent phenomenon. Okay. So that makes sure that the, that the defender understands what they're saying and why they're saying it. Okay. Oh, then he explains. First, there would seem to be two main reasons for this custom. First, it is, make, it is to make sure that the new debaters are not just answering randomly, like shooting in the dark, to make sure they know what they are saying. The second is so that they come to think automatically what the answer means. It seems that, young or old, you don't need to do this for long. <laughs> but it seems you don't need to do this for long. But it is an important step. For sure, you need to do it until the understanding is automatic. Okay? So it's like in driver's head until you, you know, know to move your right foot and, and put it on the brake, and that's automatic. You have somebody in the uh, passenger seat who has a brake. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Remember driver's said? Yeah, so that, that's good. You know, in, until you can do it automatically, it's good to have somebody in the car who has a brake. So in case, you know, you're driving around the parking lot and 
you know, you're going to hit another car and you forget, oh, what am I supposed to do? Oh, I'm supposed to stop the car. Where do I put my foot? Yeah, then at least the, the driver's ed teacher will do that for you. I learned to drive, uh, driving around Santa Ana racetrack <laughs> parking lot. This is, yeah, can you imagine where they did the horse races and dogs? That's where they took us, where they had a really big parking lot. I don't know what kind of imprints it puts in teenagers' minds. That's where they took us. Okay. Um, the guideline for spelling out the answers is the way the answer is formulated. In general, the answer is formatted. In general. Period. Using snippets of exchanges between the challenger and the defender here is how it goes. Why? <laughs> so, why does that one have the quality of that too? So the challenger walks in the room and says, it follows that the subject of pot is permanent. Why? And then the challenger says, spell out your answer, why? And the defender says, why is a pot permanent? Okay. And then the challenger needs to go, <laughs> you know, gee, I can't think of why a pot is permanent. Okay. So that, that stops the argument real quick. Okay. You should remember this when you're arguing with somebody about the spatula. <laughs> It's a good argument stopper. <laughs> okay, note well, since a consequence without a reason may also uh, present a pervasion, the why may be applied to that too. Since a consequence without a reason may also prevent, present a pervasion, the why may be applied to that too. So the, so the challenger says it follows that whatever is a color is necessarily red. Why? Okay, so this is the pervasion, you know. Is whatever red necessarily a color? So why? Spell out your answer why. Okay, and so, you know, it's like, why do you need to bother the, the, the challenger? Just say, say the whole thing. But anyway, they make the challenger say that. And then the defender says, why is whatever a color necessarily red? And then the challenger needs to think of a reason, a good one. Okay? But then if they can't, then you're done. Okay, then, so, so that was the first answer, possible answer. Your second answer is the possible answer is the reason is not established, which is formulated as the reason that, uh, that that one has the quality of that three is not established, okay? So that the subject doesn't have the quality of the, the reason, okay? So the challenger says, it follows that the subject, one with functioning thing, is a permanent phenomena because of being one with functioning thing. Okay, now what do you think about that? Okay, spell out your answer. The reason is not established. You could also state the definition here, you know, because one with functioning thing is... Um, yeah, it's not diverse. Okay, and what is one with functioning thing? Functioning thing, okay. Note well, sometimes the reason contains both a subject and a predicate inside. The subject is usually a pronoun that refers to the logical subject of the argument. This is what we did a minute ago. In this situation, the defender simply fills in the referent of the pronoun when spilling, 
spelling out the answer. For instance, Challenger says, it follows with respect to the subject, the horn of a rabbit, that it is an established base because it is a functioning thing. Okay, what do you think about that? It's not, the reason is established. Okay, why not? Or I'm supposed to say, spell out your answer, the reason is not established. Yeah. So why, why? Yeah. Okay, and then I'm going to ask you, why isn't it established? <laughs> Why not? Because it's non-existent. Okay. So in a debate, that would be your your natural thing. You know, you're making a statement that a rabbit, the horns of a rabbit, aren't a functioning thing. You know, that's not established. And maybe somebody doesn't get it, and they're going to say, "Why not?" Yeah. If it doesn't exist, why can't we say anything we want about it? Yeah, because, huh, it has no qualities. But they also say it's okay to say a horn of, of a rabbit is empty of true existence. That's okay to say. Yeah, it, yeah, but you can make that positive, that kind of positive statement about the, the horn of a rabbit. The, uh, yeah, that's true. Well, it's positive in the sense that it's true. Because I said so. <laughs> Woody, why not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, many of us have, you know, my reason is established because I said so. Yeah, we operate our lives like that, don't we? Yeah, what I said is true because I said so. Why? Because I would never say anything that isn't correct. Why? Because I'm the smartest person in the world, you know? But, I mean, that's how we run our lives. Okay, where were we with this rabbit's horn? Um, so, no, well... Normally, the answer of the reason is not established takes issue with a statement of equality. However, a consequence may also prevent a pervasion wholly included within the reason. The procedure is the same. For instance, okay, Challenger says, it follows with respect to the subject, a pot, that it is different from functioning thing. Because whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay, what do you think about that? Without looking at the book. <laughs> okay, just listen to it. It follows that with respect to the subject pot, that it is different from functioning thing because Whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Yeah. The reason's not established. Spell out your answer. The reason is not established. Is not established. Yeah. In other words, you're saying the reason is not making sense. Okay. Good. Yeah, there. Because there your reason had uh, a noun and a... It had both parts in it. What did he say? Uh, yeah. Yeah, because it had a pervasion within the within the reason. Okay. So if you if there's a if there's a statement of pervasion within the reason, then you check is that reason correct? You know, and then. And if the, here that reason isn't correct, so that stops the whole thing. If the reason were correct, you know, then you would continue. Okay, 
Then the, the third thing you can say is there is no pervasion. Formulated as it is not the case that whatever is that three necessarily has the quality of that two. So it's not, it's the formulated is if it's three, it's not necessarily two. Or whatever is three is not necessarily two. Okay, we've gone over pervasions before. Okay, so the challenger says it follows that the subject sound is a functioning thing because of being an established space. Somebody's really hung up about sound here. Okay, so what do you think about that? Follows that the subject sound is a functioning thing because of being an established space. Okay. Did did you check first? Yeah, is the reason established? Why? Because sound is an established space. Okay, but there's no pervasion. Why? Okay, because whatever is an established space is not necessarily a function. So spell out your, uh, your answer. There's no pervasion. It is not the case that whatever is an established basis necessarily a functioning thing. Okay. So I just say, why not? And the challenger says, spell out your answer. Why is there no pervasion? So I just get to the point. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Then your fourth answer is the pervasion, possible answer. The pervasion is opposite, formulated as whatever is that three necessarily does not have the quality of that two. Okay, so whatever is that reason necessarily does, is not related at all to the predicate. So Challenger says, it follows that the subject sound is permanent because of being a product. So what do you check first? The reason is established. Is it established? Yes. Okay. Then, <clears throat> but what about the pervasion? <clears throat> it's the opposite. Why? Okay, because whatever is a product is necessarily not permanent. Okay? Yeah. Then your fifth possible answer is you say, yeah, I agree with you. Okay, I accept it. Formulated as, I accept that that one, that subject, has the quality of that two, that predicate or point of clarification. Okay. Challenger says it follows that, that subject a pot is a functioning thing. And if the defender says, I accept it. Spell out your answer, I accept it. I accept that a pot is a functioning thing. Okay. Then I come along and say, why do you accept that? Why do you accept that a pot is a functioning thing? It's able to perform the function, okay. Why else? Because it's impermanent, yeah. Because it's a product, whatever. Yeah. What functions does a pot perform? Besides driving you crazy in a debate. <laughs> hmm? Huh? Cooking, okay. You can, it performs... Yeah, okay. So it produces its next moment. You can use it for cooking. Yeah. But it holds water. It's a flat bottom, bulbous based water holder. Okay. So incorporate the procedure of spelling out the answers for a while until it really, uh, it is really second nature. Please practice them as they are written above. Do not adopt the habit of automatically spelling out the answers before you have been asked. 
So don't accept some a date before the person asks you to go out. Okay? <laughs> Wait for the challenger to ask and then do it. What did I skip? Oh, okay. Note well. Oh, yeah, I did skip that. Note well, a two-part consequence, the subject and point of clarification, presents a statement of equality. However, a consequence without a reason may also present a pervasion. The procedure for answering, I accept it, uh, to such a consequence is the same. For instance, it follows that whatever is red is necessarily a color. So that's a pervasion statement. Defender says, I accept it. Challenger says, spell out your answer. I accept it. Defender says, I accept that whatever is red is necessarily a color. And then I say, why? Why is whatever is red necessarily a color? Red, that wonderful thing. Red is suitable as a hue. <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Doesn't that, you know, really prove, to, prove it to you? Okay. So then he's asking us to make uh, some examples of it. But he doesn't give us a list of, uh, he usually gives a list of, of things to do. Yeah. But he didn't, so uh, we have to go back to the beginning and and do it with what's ever said here. Okay? So you want to, we have a few minutes. You want to go with your partner and uh, go over this? <laughs> no, you're supposed to say why. Why? <laughs> Because he said it's good for you to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, so the example, I guess, number two. And uh -huh. in the, within the reason, there's another um, silly, uh, consequence. Or it's not straightforward. It's a different format. Okay. Um, it, followed, it follows that the subject, one with functioning thing, is a permanent phenomena. Oh, I'm sorry. It's actually the, uh, the second, or no, the third uh, conversation or debate. Yeah. It follows that with respect to the subject, a pot, that is different from functioning thing because whatever is an established space is necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay. Note well. No, then the next one. It follows with respect to the subject of pot that it is different from functioning thing because whatever is an established space is necessarily different from a functioning thing. So there, the, the reason is something that itself is a pervasion. Whatever the reason is, whatever is an established space is necessarily different from functioning. So I'm just wondering when you use this kind of reason, because it seems to really complicate things. Are, are they saying that a pot is necess necessarily an established base? Um, first, there's, they're saying, they're, they're saying that, yeah, but they're saying it, first it, they're saying uh, whatever is a functioning base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay. And what the word whatever there, you know, is kind of abstract. So your subject is pot. So you put in pot there. Because pot is an established base. Yeah, because pot. Yeah. Uh, okay, because pot is an established base and whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay. That part is implied. Hmm? It, that, the part that the pot is an established base, that's implied. They don't yeah. say it out. Right. Yeah, but it just seems to, like, I don't know, really complicate. 
It's not the straightforward syllogism that we've been right. seeing before. Yeah, because here the the there's a pervasion that is a syllogism. Yeah, and the pervasion is whatever is an established basis necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay, so you look at that first, and that's true. Whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Is that true? No, that's not true. Okay. No, whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Functioning thing is Yeah, and it's not different. Yeah, it's not different from functioning thing. So that that uh, that reason that the pervasion that is the reason is incorrect. So you say the reason is not established because the reason that they're giving is incorrect. So different from functioning thing. The only it, thing that's not different from functioning thing is functioning thing. Right. Established base is different from functioning thing because the only thing. Yeah, but a functioning thing is an established True. base. So you can't say whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing because an example of, of an established base that is... is... Uh, Um, <laughs> base is necessary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else want to say it here? Um, whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. Okay. But functioning thing is an established base, and it is not different from functioning thing. So that little. Uh, pervasion that is the reason is false. Okay, but is functioning thing an established base? Is functioning thing different from functioning thing? No. So then you can't say whatever is an established base is different from functioning thing, because we just gave an example of functioning thing, which is an established base, but it's not different from functioning thing. <laughs> Think about it in the morning. It, it's easier in the morning, not on Thursday night. <laughs> yeah. So in this um, example, they do imply, it is just implied that a pot is established base, but it could have been stated as because a pot is an established base and whatever is an established base is necessarily different from functioning thing. It could have been put in there. It would have been longer, but it wouldn't have had to have been implied. But, yeah, but, but that, that would have, you know, to say it follows with respect to the, that a pot is different from functioning thing because a pot is an established base and whatever is and then whatever it just makes it unnecessarily long right but but it's implied because it could have yeah. been done also in two sentences just like you did the example just now yeah. in two right. sequences but when you're making something like this you want it in one sentence right yeah but what i was going to say here is that just by pointing out that the pervasion of the reason mm -hmm. doesn't float then you don't really have to even bring... You're saying the reason is not established, but you don't even have to look at the comparison yeah, between the have... subject and the right. reason. You're just knocking the reason down on its own ground. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wouldn't it be that you couldn't give, um, like, two reasons there? Because in one syllogism, you're only meant to, like, or in one pervasion, you're only meant to give one reason, so you'd have to do that in a stepped fashion. 
you couldn't say because a pot is an established space and because whatever is an established space is this, because then you're having like, two reasons in one. Hmm. Yeah, it's probably easier for somebody to, to think of one at a time. Okay, so maybe we'll call it quits for tonight. <laughs> yeah, so, so between now and next Thursday, I mean, it would, he didn't give us uh, any specific things, he usually does. So go over the examples that are here and maybe make up some examples on your own. You know, be a challenger and say some things and then switch and be the defender and respond to them. Okay, like, you know, if I'm practicing, you know, with a partner, I might say, it follows that, uh, you know, a carpet is permanent because it's a functioning thing. Then what do you say about that? No probation. But the yeah, I said the carpet is. What did I say? The carpet is permanent because it's a functioning thing. Okay. Yeah, it's an opposite reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So make some, uh, some examples, you know, practice with somebody and, and do some examples and get used to, uh, you know, somebody saying, spell out your answer. Yeah. Okay. And you try and make, you know, start with, with some of the... Uh, things like this, but then make some interesting examples, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I mean, think of something that, that is a, an interesting type of example uh, of a syllogism or something. I, you know, use, use one of the ones we investigated before, you know, I, I am stupid because I don't understand this text. <laughs> okay, now what would you say about that? <laughs> no, we're, we're not saying I'm lazy. We're saying I'm stupid because I don't understand this text. So what do you think? <laughs> no, if I say, you know, I don't understand this text or I don't understand the subject, you know, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean. Okay, so is the reason established? Yes, yeah, I'm not understanding the text. Is the, what about the pervasion? Why not? Yeah, because whoever doesn't understand the text is not necessarily stupid. But if I say, but you don't understand, I really am stupid. <laughs> because I don't understand this text. I told you that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this isn't this how we think about things? We put ourselves down. Even somebody shows that our syllogism isn't true. We still hang on to the wrong answer and reassert it. But I really am stupid because I don't know. So we need to learn proper debate so we can refute our own stupid self-statements. <laughs> okay, so make some interesting ones like that and test it out. <laughs>